help us to understand your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are coming to your God who is willing to cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. So we will take off time to reflect on our lives. While we have sinned against him, we will ask him to forgive us. Kneeling or sitting, we'll reflect on our lives and we'll come to our Father to ask him to forgive us of our sins. So we join in the confession prayer saying, Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned in our thoughts, in our words, in what we have done and what we have failed to do. We are like lost sheep, unable to help ourselves. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive those who confess their faults as you promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. May he confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Together as forgiven children of Father in heaven, allow be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily food. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forevermore. Let us praise God for his mercy. O Lord, open our lips. Shall we rise and we join the praises? Praise the Lord. Praise King Jesus. I would like you to welcome your neighbor into the house of the Lord. High five, a handshake. Whether they are at the back, at the front, welcome them into the house of the Lord. Ask them, are they ready to praise the Lord? Are you ready to dance for the Lord? God bless you.
Jesus brings to our team and declare his words that our Lord is our sole power. us the rest that we need. Lord, we choose to trust you. You who provides everything. You who gives us the bread. Lord, we choose to trust you. Let your endless mercy flow through our hearts every day to your heart. And now you will speak to us through your word and help us to understand 
help us to hear your voice. May you silence every other voice. Only your voice shall we hear. Lord, now may you speak. Speak to us. In Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost. to Ruby, Pastor Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 3, we are reading from verse 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in this place. And I have also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. He replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. But when Sanbad, Penal, and Tobai, the Ammonite official, and Gershom, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and they betrayed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you, rebe are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is the word of God. Shall we rise? Together. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord, who is worth Praise. I have been saved by, from my enemies. The cord of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death comforted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ear. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he was angry. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. It is now, and forever shall be, what without end. Amen. Shall we have the second reading? Second reading is taken from Paul's letter to Galatians, chapter 2. We are reading from verse 11 to 14. Second letter is taken from Paul's letter to Galatians, chapter 2. We are reading from verse 11 to 14. I'm reading. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentiles believers who were not circumcised. But afterward, 
when some friends of James came, Peter would not eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticisms from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jews' laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow us, follow the Jews' tradition, the word of the Lord? We shall rise and join in a hymn led by the choir, more than conquerors. faith using the words of the apostles creed and together we'll say i believe in god the creator of heaven and the earth i believe in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the power of the holy spirit and born of the virgin mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We'll join in the prayer responses. Show us your constant love, O oh God. O oh Lord, save our president. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O oh Lord, make your ways known upon the earth. Give your people the blessing of peace. Create pure hearts in us, O oh God. Eighth Sunday in Trinity, the collect. The Bible reminds us that the Lord puts righteousness as a blessed spirit and the ailment of salvation upon his head. Almighty God, with Almighty God, you see that we have no power ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outward in our bodies and inward in our souls, that we may be defended from all the adversities which may happen to the body and from all the evil thoughts that would come our way, which may assault and hurt the souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We will join in the morning prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of the new day. Defend us, we pray, against all harm. Direct our thoughts, speech, and actions. Help us to serve you faithfully, that in our work and worship, we may always please you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We will continue with the intercessions. Let's pray. Father Almighty, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to say thank you for this new day. Say thank you for the gift of life that you've given unto us. Lord, we want to appreciate you for the Father that you have brought us, for your providence, your guidance unto our lives. We appreciate you for that good and everything that you continue doing to us. Lord, at this time, we want to pray for our church. As we pray for the leadership of the church, especially our Anglican church, in all the provinces respect, represented in this institution, we pray that God, Lord, you may grant our archbishops, bishops, and all the church leaders your health-giving spirit of grace and order, that they may truly please and serve you, Pour on them your continual dew and your blessing. Grant this, O oh Lord. We pray for those ones whom you have called to serve in your vineyard as missionaries. At different places, O oh my Father, Lord. We want to bring them unto your able hands. At this time, O oh my Father, in various places of this world, there are those ones who are persecuted because of your, of your word. We pray that, God, you encourage them, you strengthen them, and be together with them. Lord, we want to pray for our nations represented in this particular institution. Lord, we pray that you may grant our presidents authority and the power that you have given unto them, that they may lead our nations so that we may witness peace for the glory and honor of your name. Lord, we want to say thank you for this institution, Uganda Christian University, that you've given unto us and you've enabled us to be in this particular institution. It is not that we are so good than those ones who have decided to be here, but it is by your grace. I want to say thank you for this institution. As we remember the leadership of this institution, we remember the chancellor, the vice chancellor, and all those who are under them in various capacities that are serving your people in this institution. Grant them your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Continue teaching them and equipping them on how to run this institution smoothly for the glory and honor of your name. Lord, we want to say thank you for our lives. Our ministers of my Father, Lord, there are those ones whom you've called to be with you, as especially as we remember the family of our brother Wilson, a student whom you have called to rest. Lord, we want to pray for the family. At this particular trying moments, difficult moments, that you may comfort them, encourage them, give them hope. And above all, the resources that they need in preparation towards the burial, Father, may you provide unto them. Also, Father, I want to continue remembering the family of our brother, Canon Ezekiel, who has, whom, whom you have called also to be at rest with you. Lord, at this time, oh my Father, it is so sad for us in the few years that has just passed, he graduated from here. 
but Lord Father, now you have, you have seen it good for him to come and join with you. Comfort the family, strengthen them, give them hope. As we want to remember those ones who are traveling to Tanzania for the burial, we remember Canon Sender. Lord, we bring him unto your able hands. The Lord Father, you grant him good journey as he reaches there to represent us and come back safely. All the glory and honor shall come back unto you. I want to say thank you for our families. Thank you for our being here and every needs that, Lord Father, we need here. Lord, we, may you provide unto us in accordance to your will for the glory and honor of your name. Father, whatever we have not prayed, we ask you that, Lord Father, may you continue sing unto us and provide unto us. For this we pray in Jesus' name. God, you have promised that when two or three have met in your name, you will grant their requests. May you answer now, O Lord, the desires and the requests of your servants, as may be best for us. Grant us the knowledge of your truth and the gift of eternal life. Amen. We join in the words of the grace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please welcome your neighbor in the house of the Lord and thank them for coming. And as we do that, let me just find out if we have people who are worshiping with us for their very first time. If this is your first time to Pray with us. Just stretch out your hand so that we'll come in the house of the Lord. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Shall we appreciate the chapel choir for having led us? <laughs> and let me welcome those that have just returned home. The alumni, could you please stand and welcome you? In a special way, allow me to invite uh, Bridget and uh, Papa to come here. <laughs> Want to appreciate these two people, uh, Bridget and uh, Nathan, uh, fathering and mothering the chapel choir. So, so the big number and the smartness and the good behavior that we are seeing in Chapel Choir, we want to thank these two. And uh, as they give thanks and uh, serve us, we uh, want to really appreciate you so much for giving your time. Uh, they are not paid. Uh, but they do this as a ministry to nurture these ones. You see how smart they are. Could you please stand? <laughs> so I want to thank you so much as a church that you are able to nurture the chapel choir and it's able to grow. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, prayers, you've heard that we lost uh, a brother. Wilson Nadiope, he was involved in a car accident. Uh, Wilson has been doing his bachelor's, second year, bachelor's of environmental science, and uh, he's going to be with the Lord, and burial will be taking place today in Kamuli. Let's keep the family in prayer, but also our former student, uh, the can Canon Ezekiel, from Tanzania went to be with the Lord. Let's again keep the family in prayer during this trying time. Yesterday, the African Study Bible was launched. Uh, copies are still available at 70,000. And uh, if you want a better one that has a leather cover, it goes for 200,000. And please pick or bring 
the money to our office and you'll get a copy for yourself. The UCU Guild Minister of Education informs the Guild, all the Guild Fund beneficiaries that the Guild Fund Week begins tomorrow. So you should be, or you should participate. And please, for more information, go to the Guild office. I know the minister is here. Could you please stand? Kaziwe, right there. So uh, if you need more information, He's actually standing. He's not standing. <laughs> Somebody was saying here he's sitting. He's standing. <clears throat> Next Sunday, we start off the leadership conference. Uh, so we will be having one service. I encourage all of you to be part of uh, that week. Let us continue to pray for Bishop Mwaluda together with the wife and uh, the Reverend Latima Mwanguzi that will be taking us through that week. So on the same note, we'll be having one service starting at 8.30 for the next two Sundays. Please take note that we'll be having one service starting at 8.30 at 8 for 8.30 a.m., not p.m., uh, uh, for the next two Sundays. And again, throughout uh, the next month, this month and the next month, we'll be focusing on Bible characters and those, the leaders in the Bible. And uh, today, we are glad that our Vice Chancellor, the Reverend Canon Dr. John Senyonyi, is going to be uh, sharing with us. So we'll be focusing on Nehemiah and Ezra for the next two months. And we pray that you will follow through. You follow through the different series that we shall be doing. So as we prepare to receive the message, we'll also be giving back to the Lord. Uh, we will be led by the choir in the African praise. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. Will you please arise? And um, I pray that you be free in the presence of the Lord for the goodness that he has shown to you. Amen. We are going to sing a song. It's called Umoya. Um, I just want to first teach you the first verse so you can follow through. So, um, it, it goes like Umoya wenko si watatu hezeki Wambega enda weni Can you do that? Umoya wenko si watatu hezeki Wambega enda weni Again? Umoya wenko si watatu hezeki Wambega enda weni And then the last verse Ungitatala Angibekele Ujesu no bubele Angam Come on, sing that. Ungitatala Angibekele Ujesu no bubele Tatala, Ungitatala, Angi Pekele, Uche Sunobube. So we are going to follow through as we go. Let me see you clap your hands to the Lord. Umoya we go see. Umoya we go see. Watatu hezeki. Umoya we go see. Umoya we go see. Watatu hezeki. Umoya we go see. Umoya we go see. Watatu hezeki. Umoya we go see. Umoya we go see. Watatu hezeki. One
to see. shall take our seats and the choir will minister to us in a song.
Good morning. I think the only people who seem to have life are the choir. Uh, thank you for looking very smart. Uh, can I have a microphone that I can move around? Thank you. Well, thank you for being very smart and thank you for singing. I was just wondering to myself, what did we sing in that first song of the offertory? What was the meaning? <laughs> Who led us? Yes, 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 yes. Come and tell us, because you never tell us. What did you people sing? You don't know? So why were you singing? You sing with the mouth and the feeling. You don't sing with the head. Uh huh. So what was it? Praise the Lord. Yeah, the song meant um, it is all about the goodness of the Lord. It talks about um, we are not dead. We are alive because of him. And so we ought to give him praise and jump for joy. Where did you learn that? in South African language yeah. and um, it has the meaning when they post the lyrics. Oh, so you're reading off the, that's the problem with the internet. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. At least I could understand two, you know, uh, one phrase, Omoya Wenkosi. You know what that means? The spirit of the Lord. Nkosi is Lord. Omoya is Omoyo. You people, you know it. Huh? And if it is the Holy Spirit, then it becomes Omoya Mwele, Mwele, Mwele. You know how they do those things. Omoya Mwele. So thank you so much anyway. Thank you and may God bless you. Well, it's a joy to be here, especially after an extremely, extremely busy week. And speaking honestly, I was feeling quite exhausted, and my wife was saying, why do you ever get yourself in these kinds of things? I'm not looking at her, because uh, I know she may wonder why I'm saying the little secrets of our own uh, at home. But uh, I'm thankful that we have this opportunity to be able to listen uh, to God. And by the way, please welcome her back. I've not had this wife for more than a week. <laughs> eh? I know for those of you who are not married, you don't fully understand or appreciate what I'm talking about. Please do stand up for recognition. Yeah? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a better welcome than me just saying, welcome back, darling. So, you know, now you have heard. Uh, you're very welcome back. But I also want to welcome back the uh, alumni. Uh, the graduates, thank you very much for sparing the time. I think when I grow up, I'll start a university where people never graduate. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you can see the life that they have brought uh, to everything that we are doing here. Thank you so much, the alumni, uh, for coming. And I know some of you are, are freshly alumni. Uh, are all of you? I don't think all of you are freshly alumni. Who are those who are fresh? Two days... Two days ago. Ah, good, 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 good. Okay, we do have this. Thank you so much uh, for that. But uh, I think we also need uh, to celebrate with someone who has got back his wife, the Dean of Education. At last he's got back his wife because she also graduated. Uh, kindly stand up if you don't mind. And uh, yes, studying wives are very difficult wives. Yeah, I went through it, so I know what it is. So, but thank you for working hard. I know how, what, how difficult it is. You're a wife, you're working, you're a mother. Uh, what aren't you? But I think God gave women unusual abilities. I'm glad I did my PhD before I married, because otherwise it's just too complicated. Okay? It's too complicated. So, for my brother, Ivan Najuka, and uh, Edgar, 
I wish you well when you come to. If she goes to study, you'll be on your knees. Okay. This morning I was given a topic that I want to engage with. And um, it is godly leaders motivate, they do not manipulate. And it's coming out of our two passages that were read to us, one from Nehemiah, uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 17, to the end of that chapter. In fact, that's where I will dwell. But there is also, of course, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. So I wasn't very sure whether the chaplain wanted me to talk about Peter and, or Paul or even Nehemiah. So I wasn't very sure. So I chose that I'll be speaking out of Nehemiah. And the passages were read for us. But since this particular passage was read quite a while ago, and I saw some of you come in uh, just before the sermon, which means you knew the service begins at this time. So let me read that passage again. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 to 20. It's very short. Then I say to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision or disgrace. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite the Ammonite servant, and Geshem the Arab heard of it. They jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So let us pray. Blessed Father, this is your word. And this is your word written for us. The understanding of it is only by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Inspire in me, O oh Lord, a spirit of understanding, of knowledge, of discernment. But also, Lord, may you give expression to your word that as I speak, my brothers and sisters here will receive it, not as my word, but as your word. Help me to decrease that only you will increase. For you, O oh God, are pleased to speak to us. Thank you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we are talking about godly leaders who motivate that they do not manipulate. You know, there are generally two ways that normally leaders cause or influence other people. One of them is by coercion, believe it or not. And the other one is by winning the conviction of the followers so that they come to understand and to accept that where the leader leads them is the right thing. Now, I should say right at the beginning that both are actually legitimate in the right context. Let's not think that coercion is always negative. And I will illustrate this very quickly. Governments use coercion. And it's not always wrong. They use coercion, and as a simple example, you think about the security forces. When the police come and they are arresting a wrongdoer, that is, those are coercive methods. They are not going to try and convince you that what you are doing is wrong. The courts of law themselves will use coercion. You may convince yourself that you are right, but once the court of law has said this is what has been judged innocent or I mean they don't normally actually say innocent. You know why? Because only God knows who is innocent. 
So they normally say not guilty. Guilty or not guilty. So coercion is not necessarily bad. Of course, it can be misused. The powers and the authority of government, we know very well, has been misused again and again. But the church in particular preaches to convert people in their hearts. To convince people about Jesus Christ. So that they themselves may choose to follow. So the church is more concerned about convincing you and the Holy Spirit comes to convict us so that from within we own what is there. And so even preachers, it's wrong when a church starts using coercive ways to lead people to Christ. Leave that to Muslims and those other kind, kinds of people. The church is not given power to coerce. When I came to the Lord Jesus Christ in 1976, it's because I was convinced I should. And from the moment I came to Christ, I was convinced that not only should I believe it, nobody coerced me to say, talk about it. Because I was convinced, I talked about it. There was no coercion. However, what, let me first of all dwell briefly on the whole idea of manipulation. Manipulation differs from coercion because very often what manipulation does is honest to influence others. And the motives themselves may be wrong. Leaders manipulate because their cause maybe has no merit before the hearers, before the followers. So you manipulate them. The people are not convinced and even you yourself are not convinced what you are doing is right, but you want them to do it so that it may benefit you and therefore you manipulate. Or when the leader lacks the moral and convictional authority. You know, it's a, one of the worst things that can ever happen to a leader is to lose moral authority. When, for me as vice chancellor, and, I f and it's found out that I have used money irregularly. I have taken money for myself. I lose moral authority to tell the staff members to use money with integrity. You understand what I mean? That's loss of moral authority. When people lose moral authority, they tend to use manipulation. And I have to admit that this is all too common. People use it quite a bit. I think a very good example of someone who used a lot of manipulation was King Saul. King Saul had ways. And you know some of these things just happen within someone's head. And they may cause you to do things, but actually they have hatched a plan in how to make you do what they want you to do, not necessarily because you are convinced. And Saul was even worse, he even used manipulation on God. For example, at a time when he had to offer a sacrifice, he was waiting for Samuel, I'm sure you know that story, it comes in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and even chapter 14, you'll get it there, but that one comes in chapter 13, where Samuel told him, wait for me. Because they had a war to wage. And the Philistines were on the other side. And he kept on waiting and waiting. And then he realized, hey, there is a little bit of trouble. These Philistines are going to fall on us. So he decided that God must be manipulated more or less like people in witchcraft manipulate the gods they worship. You know witchcraft uses a lot of manipulation because essentially what they do, give this idol this and that and that so that the idol can do what you want. We need to understand that the faith in God is very different. So he went ahead and offered a sacrifice although it was wrong. He was king, he was not priest. He should not have done it. So Saul we understand very well, he does quite a bit of that. 
Another time, in fact, in the next chapter there, uh, chapter 14, now they are at war indeed with the Philistines. And he swears nobody should eat anything. And you know, probably he's trying to say this so that people can be convinced that he himself is such a godly man, such a committed man, so devoted to them. Nobody should eat anything until evening. Let's first finish these Philistines. Now, can you imagine leading an army that is hungry? And you know what? It came back on his own head, at least in two ways. One, Saul Jonathan, his son, could not become king. But secondly, even he himself, the entire family, was removed from the kingship. So friends, I want us to look at this man, Nehemiah. Nehemiah. And let me just say a few preliminary important truths that I want you to take note of. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Nehemiah. But the book of Nehemiah has a cupbearer. Nehemiah was a cupbearer in the kingdom. And that story is told in the first chapter. Let me read for you verse 1. There says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped who had survived. Verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had, who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Ezra had already gone back. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. So now we jump to chapter 2, verse 1. I wish I, I had time, I would have read all of that. But anyway, now chapter 2, verse 1 says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. His job was to put a drink in the hands of the king. So this, is, this was his job. This was his vocation. But we need to understand something. If you've never read that chapter, I really want to encourage you now that I understand you'll be covering Nehemiah and Ezra. Read it over and over again. You know, when we are counseling people for marriage, there are certain books we tell you, read them at least three times. Certain passages. Song of songs. Read it thoroughly. Because we want you to understand it. Now, I want to encourage you, even in this case with the book of Nehemiah and even the book of Ezra, read it until you have absorbed it. That's how you'll get the greatest benefit out of it in these messages. However, when you read the book of Nehemiah, there is one refrain that recurs again and again. And it comes up a little bit in our particular passage. And that is the refrain, the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. That God's hand was on Nehemiah for good. Now, why does he keep on saying that? For the very simple reason that as far as Nehemiah is concerned, the story of what God did through him was not his story, was not something that he did. It was the hand of God that was working in him through him for good. And if you don't understand that, it's very important, by the way, for the topic that we have here. Because, you see, you start manipulating people when you think everything depends on you. When you think whatever do you are doing is actually yours. But if you get to understand that whatever you are doing is actually God's work, then it becomes a different thing. The second thing I want you to note is that we must understand Nehemiah's perspective of his role in this book. We must understand that. What does he, how does he see himself doing? First of all, like I've said, he sees God's hand. It's the one that's working. And therefore, the entire book is a mere testimony of what God is doing through him. But the second one, how did he see his own role? Now, I'm not going to talk about these things, but I believe that in the coming weeks, you'll be hearing more. 
Because you see, the way you see yourself is important for the way you treat others or you deal with others as a leader. Is it any surprise that when, God, when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, he talked, yes, about loving God with everything you are, but then in the end he said, love your neighbor as who? As yourself. Why? Because if you don't love yourself, it will also have an impact on how you treat others. And the same thing even in this case. If you don't understand your role, why you are doing what you are doing, why you are a leader, you yourself, what is it for me to be a leader? It becomes difficult for you to know how you are going to handle other people. And so you start using manipulation instead of motivating them as we will be seeing. Thirdly, Nehemiah saw himself as fulfilling God's purpose for Israel. He did not see this as merely building a wall. He was actually seeing himself as someone who is doing this work for the whole nation. Let me refer you to chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. Now remember, he's praying, I'm sorry that I'm not telling you everything, but you need to read the book for yourself because the whole thing begins with knowing that the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down and he becomes very grieved because of the situation in which the children of Israel are. So it's, he's now praying. And he says, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather you, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people. Do you see how he sees these people? He does not see them as people that I lead. You know, sometimes leaders have a tendency of owning the people that they, they lead. But Nehemiah does not see it that way. He sees his whole work as part of the greater salvation story that God had started in Moses. But fourthly, Nehemiah had faith in God that God is unconquerable. God is invincible. Nehemiah believed that the God of heaven will make us prosper. And that's what he says. He will make us prosper. This is the kind of confidence that is not proud. It's not arrogant. Because actually his confidence was in God. But because he was assured, he had a faith in this God. And leadership, a particularly godly leadership, cannot be separated, of course, in a firm faith. A confident faith in God. But also, Nehemiah was a man with a burden for his people. From the very beginning of that book, he hears about the walls that have been broken down. What does he do? He himself breaks down in tears and goes before God in prayer and fasting. Why? Because he had concern for his people. He had love for his people. Now, the people that you love, you do not manipulate, do you? That is the point that he's making. So Nehemiah was a man who had a burden for his people. And listen to what he says to these people. That we may no longer suffer disgrace, derision. Because he's concerned for them. He had a heart for the welfare of his people. Let's now go on to say a few things more directly about our topic. But I want you to understand, like I've already said, that who Nehemiah was and what he saw to be his mission are critical to understanding the way he carried out his leadership roles. I want to deal with only four points here. The first one that we must understand, and that's what comes forth from chapter 1, Nehemiah, and that must be the first thing, committed his ways to the Lord. He committed his ways to the Lord. 
If we say that we are godly leaders, there is absolutely no other way that we can do it. When I had just been announced to become the vice chancellor, I remember people asking me, what do you want us to pray for? And maybe many of them want, I want you to pray for wisdom. But I did not say that. It's not wisdom. You know what wisdom did to Solomon? What did it do to him? It moved from actually serving God and now he saw himself as such a wise man. He was wealthy. He had everything. And by the end, Solomon was no longer walking with God. Not that wisdom was wrong, but the problem is when we want wisdom for the sake of it. When we want wisdom apart from God. No, my prayer that I say to people and that I still pray even up to this moment is what I call Moses' prayer. In Exodus 33, what did Moses pray? In Exodus 33, verse 12 to 16, you read it for yourself in your own time, but you've got to start from chapter 32 to understand the context. But Moses prayed for God's presence. And he said to God, if you will not go with us, do not take us from here. It's the presence of God, because the presence of God is actually what gives us everything else. It will give us the wisdom. It will give us the resources. It will lead us through the difficulties. You know, leadership is not fine sailing. You are going to go through all sorts of situations. Therefore, Nehemiah understood the first thing he, he did after hearing about the walls of Jerusalem, he committed his ways to the Lord. That's the first thing. When he heard about the conditions, it was clear. You see, to turn yourself over to God is to say, I'm inadequate of myself to do this task. It's just that simple. And a leader who believes he's adequate of himself or herself is a leader then who will depend on everything that they have, including manipulative powers to manipulate other people. That's the very first thing. And I think it's important for us to understand about Nehemiah. He was inadequate of himself. Paul also did actually confess. Not that we are adequate of ourselves. And indeed, none of us should ever see ourselves as if we are adequate of ourselves. Particularly, we who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because to know the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you bring to Jesus Christ to be saved? You bring your inadequacy. You bring your sin. That's the only thing you bring. You don't bring your good works. You know, like many people in the churches, they think, oh, but I've been baptized, I've been confirmed. You've gone through the motions, I'm married in church, I do give in church, I'm a warden in church, I'm this and that. That's simply giving you a curriculum vitae. The only curriculum vitae that qualifies us for salvation is our inadequacy. So it is, even in the case of Jeremiah. He understood that I am inadequate of myself, and what I need is God. What can I do? I mean, he was a cupbearer. He sought favor with the king, with King Artaxerxes in chapter 2. And the purpose was seeking. First of all, he prayed to God. And by the way, it's very interesting when you read that text. And I only do this because I know some of you may not have read it. But look at verse 4 of chapter 2. Then the king said to me, because he saw his countenance. His face, which was sad. And by having a face that was sad and he was carry, carrying a cup, he was actually endangering his own life because the king could easily interpret that to mean that this man has ill will toward me. But listen. So the king sees it. Well, let me begin from verse 3. I beg your pardon. Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Verse 4. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? What did he do next? Listen, he had been having a time of prayer and fasting. He had spent a lot of time praying before this. But what do we hear? So I pray to the God of heaven. Now, I don't think he said to the king, king, let's first pray. There was no prayer meeting before that. 
He, play, he prayed under his breath. But he knew that he was inadequate of himself and what he needed most was God to take charge of the whole situation. What I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, is that we need to understand as godly leaders, if we are to motivate other people, let them first see our faith. Let them first see us as people whose lives are totally surrendered to God. Let us be a people who look to him as our only source. You know, in Uganda, the cry is government here to Yambe. <laughs> Everyone cries to government as if government is God. And of course, government loves that. To hear that government is the almighty provider. Yeah? So it sounds great. Because if, God, if I'm the almighty provider, then I know everyone will come crawling to me. That's what, in politics, that is actually legitimate. Well, not legitimate, but that is expected usually. But it's not that. Nehemiah understood that even before the king, it was not government yet to Yambe. As far as he was concerned, he prayed. The second thing that I want to mention to you, my brothers and sisters, he considered himself as which is very interesting. He does not say, do you see the trouble you are in? He says, do you see the trouble we are in? There is a very important difference between the two. Because in one, it's like I'm here to help you. In the other, he's saying, all of us are part of this problem. And therefore, Nehemiah here puts himself together with the plight that the people were in. And he says, do you see the trouble we are in? That we is very important. And by the way, when you're reading the Bible and interpreting the Bible, don't ignore words. That's why many times I don't like, well, when I'm doing thorough study of the Bible, I don't want to use paraphrases. Many of you get used to paraphrases. Paraphrases essentially are not direct translations. So people are more concerned in, um, in other words, the person who is doing the paraphrase does a little bit of interpretation of what is meant. Now, they are good for clarity, but they are not good for your thorough primary study of the scriptures. You need to do it for yourself. In fact, uh, the chaplain knows the other day there was a reading here from Romans chapter 13, and I said to her, that must be a paraphrase, because this word exists in the original. The part where it says the leader does not bear the sword for nothing, and the word sword was, is there, but was missing. And I said, no, that's, that's not. There is a word sword there. Let's not fear it because it causes death. Paul knew it causes death. And he was saying sword. Anyway, so the point here is that Nehemiah puts himself with his people. Their plight is his plight. You see, the first step to motivating people, my friend, or let me say the second, is to be with the people. To be with the people. Many people talk about this universe, and I'm glad my predecessor did it. I do it. But to think that a vice chancellor is only seen at graduation, that's what happened with me. Right? When I was graduating at the University of Nairobi, I had never seen the vice chancellor. I saw him at graduation. But that's wrong. You have to be with the people. What is the use of keeping yourself separate from people? It doesn't help at all. So I, we only used to hear Dr. Karanja. He eventually became a minister, actually, in government. Dr. Karanja, Dr. Karanja. And by the way, he was married to a Mtoro woman from here. He's now dead. You see the trouble we are in. And he was talking about it as one of them. And in fact, when you read on and you continue with that part, with the book, you get to realize that even when he was supervising the construction of the wall, Nehemiah was not a supervisor just passing by to see who is working and who isn't. He himself was part of the construction. 
can I encourage you, my brothers and sisters? I know we have all sorts of models, African models of leadership, which are wrong in my thinking. But this whole business of thinking that you never touch the dirt does not belong to leadership. If the people are touching the dirt, touch the dirt. Right? If the people are touching the dirt, what do you do? Touch the dirt. Many years ago, in this universe, I'm sure Dr. Rebecca remembers. I remember when we used to talk about uh, chairs being broken and so on. And I mean, some of the students were just reckless. Or littering the campus and so on. There is great improvement now, but I'm not satisfied yet. And you know what many, some of the students would say? But we pay fees. Now, those are people I would never employ in a leadership position. Never. Those are people who do not have a leadership heart as we are talking about. Because if you touch the dirt, as the people touch the dirt, you motivate them. But if you start telling them, you'll find all different ways of how to get them to work. The third that we need to look at, Nehemiah shared his testimony. You see, these were people who were discouraged. And he had already heard about it. Like he read about it for you in chapter 1, those first few verses. The people were discouraged. They were in a difficult situation. How are you going to encourage people who are discouraged? What does he say? And I told them of the hand of my God. Listen to how he personalizes it. That had been upon me for good. Let me digress just a little bit. One of the most powerful things, if you're saved, one of the most powerful things that you have is your testimony. Your testimony. Because nobody can dispute it. But your testimony does a lot more. It helps people to understand that where they are, you have been and you have come to realize there is a better way. That there is salvation in our Lord Jesus. That's why I say I give that testimony often. Maybe a little bit of what I grew up with in the East African Revival. Because in the East African Revival, people were never sparing with their testimonies. In fact, the moment people would meet, we've not seen each other for a, a few days, the first thing they would do is to share testimony. This is what the Lord has been doing in my life. And so even telling the unbeliever, this is what the Lord has been doing in my life. I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now for some of you, we don't even know if you're saved. Even your closest friends don't know. You just some saved. But what happened? And I have found that many people actually do not even know how to share what the Lord has done in their life. Your testimony. Listen to Nehemiah. Nehemiah understood that the best way to encourage the people to motivate them is to understand God has already done it. He can do it again. That's motivation. That's motivation. You see, a truthful testimony inspires and motivates. And I've seen many people. I've even preached in places. I remember one time when I was still working with African Evangelist Enterprise, we were in Lusaka. I was invited in, the, it was a very big hall. I think it was like a community hall or something. And a crowd had gathered. And you know, we would preach so many times a day, sometimes even as many as five times a day. And at that particular time, I could not think of what I should be sharing. You know what I did? I simply shared my testimony. And after that, I called people to come to Christ. And believe it or not, they came in good numbers. Your testimony. It's encouragement. It helps other people to be inspired, to be motivated. A testimony cannot be, nobody can say, no, what you're telling us is not true. A testimony is like you're telling people, this is how I overcame. You too can overcome. A truthful testimony shows that the leader is authentic. You're authentic. Because who could doubt Nehemiah when he says, this is how the hand of God worked with me. And he could tell the story. It encourages others that the leader has stood where they stand. 
It's like when we talk to you, the younger people. You know, because the challenges that you go through, you may think, oh, you people, you old people, you don't know. You don't know. Why wouldn't I know? I've been where you are. You've never been where I am. Have you? No. My friend, if you are still in your 20s, for me, I'm in my 60s. And I passed through the 20s. The context may have changed, but let me share with you a testimony that will inspire you, that will motivate you. That's what I'm saying. But the final point that I want to make about Nehemiah, Nehemiah withstood the enemies of his people. And I don't need to say too much about that. You can read about that from verse 19. There was Sanballat, there was Tobiah, there was Geshem the Arab. And so they were jeering at them, despising the work that they were doing. Are you rebelling against the king, they said. But I replied, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Now he, as someone who had been given a letter from the king, he, as someone who had been before God and had understood what God had done in his life, who saw himself as a man on mission, doing the work of God. It was not some other people. It was not the followers to withstand. It was the leader standing up for his people. And when you stand up for your people, you motivate them. Right? You motivate them. So he became a defender of his people. He did not run away. And that's an important point for us to understand. Because people want someone who stands with them. And when I say stands with them, I'm not saying stands with them in the wrong things. Right? If it is the wrong things, you've got to tell people you're doing the wrong thing. You see, it's only politicians who stand with you when you're doing the wrong thing. They want to make sure they don't annoy you because the vote may be lost. Well, sorry. Not a proper leader. At least not a godly leader. But you stand with them when they are being attacked. You stand with them that they may be able to move on. So brothers and sisters, God calls us to motivate. And that's the lesson for today. Not to manipulate when we are in positions of leadership. Manipulation is what people do when they have no more authority, when they have their own selfish reasons, when they are being hypocritical. May God bless you. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word. It is your word and you know what has gone forth and what each person will get out of it. We ask for your Holy Spirit somehow to go with us and continue teaching us out of this that in all things we will the name. I pray for my brothers and sisters. Many of them are, not, are probably not seeing themselves as leaders yet. But they are. Because there are people looking after them. But there are also those, oh God, there is also a future that you've prepared for them. May we learn from Nehemiah that we shall be an inspiration to others. We shall be able to motivate others because you use us. Into your hands we commit ourselves in Jesus Christ our Lord. hand clap to the Lord. A challenge to all of us to be committed, to be concerned, to testify, and to defend. I pray that this will remain with us as we go out and we'll put it to action. God ask us to stand and we conclude in prayer.
precious Lamb of God, we want to thank you for you have called us as leaders. That we shall serve your people without manipulating them. My master will go before them. That we will work with them. That we shall be committed to you, you who has given us the authority. That we shall have the concern for those that we are leading telling them of the great things that you've done before and those that you're going to do before us. But Lord, that we shall defend them. Now friends, the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you as you lead and as you serve. The Lord give you that peace that the world can never give. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you so much, Dr. John, for sharing with us. And thank you all of you for being part of this service. As we go out, the choir will lead us in a hymn.